eminent leaders and thinkers in the cancer community came together in early June at the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting, or ASCO, for a first-of-its-kind roundtable event. The session, sponsored by Amgen and its Breakaway from Cancer initiative, was designed to highlight potential areas for improvement throughout the spectrum of cancer care and inspire action by establishing several calls to action for the cancer community and health policymakers. The roundtable event featured leaders from each of the four Breakaway from Cancer partner organizations, distinguished community and academic oncologists, Drs. Lee Schwartzberg and John Marshall, and special guest speaker Patrick Dempsey, actor and founder of the Patrick Dempsey Center for Cancer Hope and Healing, who joined the meeting virtually via video conference. The event was moderated by Susan Denser, editor-in-chief of Health Affairs and contributor to PBS NewsHour. Discussion at the event focused on each stage of the cancer continuum, including prevention and screening, delivery of and access to quality cancer care, and patient support and psychosocial services. This podcast, the third in the Breakaway from Cancer Striking the Balance series, will focus on dialogue surrounding how to improve the delivery of and access to quality cancer care. The final podcast will present 10 mandates for change, endorsed and ratified by the partner organizations, which will form a roadmap for future advocacy efforts on behalf of people living with cancer. Countless advances in cancer treatment, detection, and prevention have transformed the disease that was once considered an automatic terminal diagnosis to one that is often manageable and sometimes curable. However, patients can only reap the benefits of advances if they have reliable access to quality cancer care based on evidence, regardless of where they receive treatment. So we know that cancer patients feel loss. Why shouldn't they? They come up against an, a non-integrated, highly fragmented system. So how do we begin to move to a much more integrated, much more seamless, what, much more patient-centered system where people don't feel so lost? John, let me start with you. I think it's, it's very complicated. And I think cancer medicine changed dramatically from even since I've been in practice to now. It was much simpler. We were worse at it. Um, people, you know, we did not have many therapies, and, and, and they were very similar across the board. And it's evolved into a highly complex, multidisciplinary, disease-oriented process um, where, you know, in GI cancers, the, the surgeons and the radiation oncologists and the gastroenterologists and the medical oncologists form a, a team more than I do with my other medical oncology partners. And so the concept of subspecialty care or disease-oriented care, um, the, the whole world of colon cancer or pancreas cancer is very different than the world of lung cancer or breast cancer or leukemia or lymphoma in many ways. They have common bonds. Um, but they're, they're different. And, and um, so the, in my opinion, as we move forward into, you know, how do we go from here, um, that would be one helpful way uh, to uh, offer the kind of guidance um, and information uh, and multidisciplinary care that would drive us for the next several decades. The whole concept of, you know, patient navigators that you raise is a, is a great thing. Um, you know, those of us who've had cancer touch our families, you know, no matter how ready you are for that, um, the, the, you know, the rug is pulled out and you're falling and, and you want somebody to catch you. Um, and to have a one-stop shop where somebody who can tell you all the things you need to do um, as the next step is, is really vitally important. So you can then worry about your family and your kids and your, you know, the rest of your life and your job as you essentially have to drop a lot of that to deal with these other things. And we know that the entire U.S. healthcare system is characterized by inexplicable variations in the way care is delivered from place to place. And we also know that this is true in cancer, Lee. Do, is this the kind of approach that would get to more uniformity? And I don't mean uniformity in the sense that everybody gets rubber stamp care. Obviously, a very important feature of this is going to be individualized care as we understand more and more about the molecular bases of cancer. But how do we at least get everybody up to one basic higher level standard of care? Well, I think it's important for everyone to recognize that the business model has changed and it continues to change. When I was in training 25 years ago, cancer care was delivered by a small number of practitioners in academic medical centers and it was inpatient therapy. It was very toxic, and the results, as John said, weren't very good. But 
what has also changed over time, of course, is that we've developed uh, outpatient delivery, which has allowed the vast majority of people to get care in their hometown, which I think everyone would agree with their support systems is ideal if the resources are correct for that. And uh, the rise of information technology, at least in delivery, has helped dramatically in having access to the latest protocols, to the latest scientific discoveries. What's happening, the change now, is uh, the quality movement, which I, I'm excited about. And it's being driven by a number of different factors. And, and it's partly being driven by payers, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think we have to step up and prove quality. We have to have metrics of what constitutes quality in cancer care. Those are very difficult to determine exactly what that means. But more and more practices are putting in electronic medical records, and I think that in oncology in particular, um, we're a discipline that is, is leading the forefront, as we have in clinical research in general in, in medicine. And uh, information technology is being embraced, and so we'll ha start to have the data to compare outcomes. I think that patients, that, that the system disconnects patients from the science of what's going on. And so one of the things we've talked about is, is are there, is there a way for a patient to participate in clinical research that doesn't necessarily have to be a full-on clinical trial? Can they, for example, consent to their tumor sample being in a national database? And can they get a big button or sticker mm -hmm. that says, I support clinical research, I'm, I'm participating in clinical research? So I think if we connected patients to that conversation and gave them the chance to understand it and be a part of it, one of the things we're doing now is we're doing treatment decision counseling with patients earlier on, earlier in the diagnosis. We need to be sitting down with patients, making a care plan, doing this treatment counseling with them so that they have an entry point and they have a roadmap for this. And I'm afraid that in most practices around the country, that is not happening and patients are not getting a roadmap. Well, I think part, we need to really look at what does the business process look like in oncology and in cancer care and how can we realign the incentives in the system to have more of a system that really uh, empowers patients to participate in their care, to get engaged in the conversation with the medical professionals so that there's shared decision making and um, really provides the information so that patients are fully informed as they're making decisions with their medical professionals about the type of care and then have the information they need to go through uh, treatment and survivorship. I think um, when you look at a lot of the uh, major academic cancer centers, they recognize the importance of survivorship and, and many of them are trying to do care planning in one form or another and begin to integrate it. I agree with all that my colleagues on this panel have said, but I think there's also a disconnect. We absolutely need care planning and we've been in Washington for a number of years now trying to get legislation passed so that there would be a system of reimbursement for physicians and their practices for care planning. We have enormous potential in law. We have checks that are about to go in the mail on October 1st for on electronic health records. We got all of this in law. What's going to make it happen? What's going to make it a reality for cancer patients in 2014 and beyond that they'll have uh, truly the kind of integrated care delivery system that we've been talking about? I don't think that the fact that a check is ready to go in the mail is, means that the systems are in place for this integrated care that we, all, that we all are striving for. So I think the law is ahead of the practice in that regard. I just, I just don't think we're there. We definitely have, at a minimum, two levels of health care in the United States of America. I would propose in this discussion that we have three. We have a Medicaid system that is going to address the needs of the neediest in the country. We have a Medicare system that is going to deliver a different set of intervention and planning for the seniors and the disabled in the country. And then we have the middle section, which has a wide variety of what these commercial plans are going to be offering. We're at a place where there's a tremendous opportunity for all the various stakeholders to come together and to do something about changing the system, and it's an opportunity that we really haven't had for generations. We want systems. We want, you know, that comprehensive and coordinated care to be available to patients, and we want patients involved in determining their care. Why can't we all rally around that 
and start driving towards implementing health reform in a way that's going to provide that system. Well, let's go back to health care reform for a moment because there's a lot of good news in this for cancer patients as there is for most uh, Americans. Uh, getting rid of pre-existing condition restrictions, obviously a huge boon to people with cancer going forward. Uh, as having broad benefits package, essential benefits packages, having subsidies to enable people who can't afford coverage to access those packages, et cetera. So there's, a, there's so much good in this. How do we put all of that together with the delivery system reform pieces? Based on our current health insurance model, I'm making different treatment decisions from one room to the next in the same clinical scenario using what I would say are less optimum medicines in one setting um, than because of simple insurance barriers. So, you know, when, and our, so there's, there, this part has to be resolved too, in my opinion. We never talk about it, but every doctor rations care every day just in the way we're thinking about it. Every practice does, and the patients make decisions as well. So we have to, we have to elevate that. We have to put that on the table. Care is rationed all the time, and maybe health care reform will help us take some baby steps away from that. It already is in terms of covering people who don't have coverage and uh, doing away with pre-existing, particularly for cancer patients. That's good. We, we approve drugs with a concept called safety and efficacy right now, which is, and they're told to ignore the sense of cost or what I like to call value. Mm -hmm. So, um, and value is more than just how much you pay for something. Value is magnitude of benefit. It, it has a lot of components to it. Um, and so one argument I think that would help all our causes, um, both in the drug development and care delivery, is to begin applying some concepts of value to health care. I think we all have tremendous optimism about health care reform, and, and I think we all agree that it's going to have a positive uh, impact for patients. But knowing that patients are dealing with this level of distress and that, that the majority of personal bankruptcies in this country are as a result of health care costs, God's sake, how can it get any worse? And so for the consumers, um, as our patient data analysis reports have now reported out for 14 consecutive years, the majority of people coming to us are insured consumers playing by the rules in the United States of America. And yet when they're diagnosed with cancer, they are very quickly moving against the precipice of bankruptcy and financial ruin. Stay tuned for the last podcast in the Striking the Balance series, which will focus on patient support and survivorship.